I must say my own reaction is sort of if this is the answer why isn't everybody grabbing it why is uh, as you said your friend said that you've gone a wall what's the fundamental sort of psychological reason why what you propose which seems reasonable is completely as far as I can tell saying the or center bank of friend saying no 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 we're not going to touch this well it is because of the political risks. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced, and I set it out in a, a more technical paper than my book at the uh, research conference of the IMF, that there are no technical arguments against monetary finance whatsoever. And it'd be a bit odd if there were, given that people like Ben Bernanke and Milton Friedman and Henry Simons, who were pretty clever people, had reached the same conclusion. And when I presented that paper at the IMF, the respondent was Lars Svensson, a very respected uh, macroeconomist, and he said, no, this hangs together uh, as a piece of uh, macroeconomics. But the political risks are severe, and sometimes you, you, you build a taboo against temptation. Uh, you know, some people don't trust themselves to drink alcohol in reasonable amounts and the only way they know to make sure they don't do it in excess amounts is to say I will never have it I mean lots of us do that in particular bits of our private life some of us uh, need to do it and societies sometimes need uh, to do it so there is a good political reason for this taboo and it has become a core belief system of central banks if you look at emerging markets around the world one of the great achievements of the 1960s and 70s and 80s as we moved out of periods of hyperinflation high inflation was creating uh, <coughs> central bank mandates where the central banks were not allowed to fund budget deficits. I mean, if you want to understand why Brazil or Argentina had inflation rates of a thousand percent, it was because the finance minister could uh, call up the central banker and say, well, how about sending some more money over to fund this fiscal deficit? And the central bankers of the world feel that they won a great and important fight in slowly spreading across the world uh, this uh, taboo uh, against monetary finance. But the difficulty is circumstances change and sometimes they've changed so much that a taboo which was useful when your problems were inflationary uh, has become harmful today. Now the bit which I didn't talk about but I'm going to talk at a lecture in two lectures in Munich and Frankfurt next week. So I'm taking my debates... Let's all fly there. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm taking my, 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 my arguments into the sort of inner core of, of uh, German uh, sound money. Uh, I'm going to argue that it is possible to constrain <coughs> what I am suggesting within the limits of central bank independence. That we could give to an inflation targeting central bank the clear legal authority to say, you are the person which must say what is the maximum amount of this uh, monetary finance which is allowable. It's not for the government to decide, you decide the maximum amount. And I don't see why we can't do that as the self-denying ordinance in the same way that we've handed to central banks rather than finance ministries the, co the control of interest rates. So I am still arguing this debate. The one thing I will still say, and, and finally on this point, Kishore, is whether you think it should happen or not, there is some places in the world, and in particular one place, where it's going to happen whether you like it or not, and that's Japan. I will simply assert that Japan now has so much government debt that there is no possibility whatsoever that that is ever going to be repaid in the normal sense of the word repay. I, the Japanese government switching from a primary deficit to a primary surplus and paying back the debt. I also believe that there is no possibility whatsoever that the large quantities of, of government bonds which have been bought by the Bank of Japan will ever be sold back to the private sector. I think de facto what is happening in Japan is permanent monetization. And I'll say one very interesting thing in that respect. When I first met Kuruda-san, mm. the governor of the Bank of Japan, uh, we were introduced by Martin Wolf, and uh, mm. Martin had told uh, Kuruda something about uh, uh, what I was up to and thinking about. He came in with a great smile on his face mm. and a book. And he said, 
I think you might be interested in this book, and it was the English language biography of Finance Minister Takahashi. Mm. And uh, I said at the end, well, are you doing a Takahashi? And he just laughed. Um, because I think what is essentially going to happen in Japan is that they are going to permanently monetize government debt while continuing at each step on the road to say that that's not what they're doing. And as you know, <laughs> and as you know Kuroda-san uh, created a stir in Davos yeah. because he repeated the same phrase of Mario Draghi and he said the Central Bank, the Bank of Japan will do whatever do it whatever takes. Do whatever it takes. Yeah. So he used Mario Draghi's language. Yeah. One quick question, one more quick question. You, you had a two part. You had one part about monetizing and yeah. the other part about getting the, center, uh, the private sector banks to increase their deposits, right? Well, increase their capital. Their, their capital, capital, yeah. yeah. So to from what, right now it's seven eight percent to twenty percent. Yeah, something like that. Now, uh, which bankers are going to embrace your idea? Well, well, not many. <laughs> not, not, not many. Look, I, I was very careful to say that if, was, if I was a benevolent, you don't dictator. seem to have many friends, huh? No, no, no. I, 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 don't, I don't know why I've written this book. I mean, I, 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 used to, I used to have central banker friends. I used to have commercial banker friends. No, they're still friends. They just think I've gone mad. Um, you know, you can still be friendly with somebody who you think you know just just lost it. Um, no, look. <laughs> there is a re the, the fundamental problem with much higher bank cap, and th this has been argued by other people as well. There's a fine book by Adnata Marty and, and Martin Helwig uh, called The Banker's New Clothes, which argued this and produced a major stir uh, a couple of years ago. There is undoubtedly a problem in transition. When you take capital ratios which are too low and you increase them, you create a period of time in which as the banks are meeting those higher capital standards, they may cut credit by too much to the real economy. And that's why I said very carefully, this is what I would do if I was the benevolent dictator of a greenfield economy, mm -hmm. right? If I could absent myself from all the difficult transitional problems of how I go from A to B. So. I think sometimes it's useful to set down what your ideal would be, mm. even if you don't think you're going to get to an ideal. But I do think that our general tendency should be to have much higher capital requirements in the banking system. We did, within the capital reforms of Basel III, very significantly increase capital standards because we tightened up the definition of what counts as equity, we tightened up how you define risk-weighted assets, and we changed the ratio. Probably as a result of that, in terms of how much we increased the absolute absolute minimum capital ratio that you could get away with, we probably increased it three or four times, effectively, uh, in total. And I'd like to do that another twice, at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, question. We'll take one or two questions and then... Uh, yeah, please come to the microphone if you don't mind. Yes, Let's uh, take the questions thank, together. Thank you for uh, you presenting yourself as a benevolent person. Yeah. Although I think the, uh, the idea of uh, printing money is something uh, suitable for war. Mm -hmm. Like the Japanese who print the banana currency mm -hmm. and who succeeded in taking over Singapore and staying here for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it took a nuclear bomb to, to, to change their minds. Um, on the side of you printing money, and then you say you want to do something with credit, but I think it would cause some inequality because, I mean, you do admit it does cause inequality, as well as maybe probably even more a credit problem. Because, I mean, where does the money go except maybe to be lent to someone else? On the side, I must admit that I'm not an economist, but on the side of my observation of your high intellect that uh, you seem to be very intent on pushing the printing of money, and I presume it's to do with good moral values, like something like the increase in GDP will allow um, more money to be transferred to charity in that aspect. But I was just wondering, sir, whether you have considered that uh, moral values does not be totally dependent on GDP. In, in so far as uh, maybe leaders could be uh, nicer people, they could volunteer more often, they could uh, portray a more healthy lifestyle as an example to everyone else so that maybe society could be improved besides going the way of printing money and increasing GDP. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, next question. We'll take all three together okay. if you don't mind. We're running out of yeah. time. We'll try and finish in about five minutes or so. So <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. And then I'll come to you, the last, uh, to all together. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I do have a PhD of finance and I'm in, from Europe and a master of finance from Hong Kong. And I used to be a which banker. Is, which is better? Hong they, Kong or you? It, is, it, is, it is not better or worse. They, com, they complete each other. Um, I used to work in a bank, also in a city bank, also in Unicredit, Credit. And now I am in, let's say, these financial institutions. Uh, we say one thing. Actually, the problem is the basil itself. 
and I believe this is the big problem you need to focus on. What you have done since 2008 for small and medium enterprises in Europe and all around the world, you make harder for them to make business, for SMEs. For large corporates, you make it just the way it was. It is easier for a banker to give big loan to a large <coughs> corporate. But if you are moving the money around the world, if you are trying to get a credit as SME, it's just harder and harder. And the banker is saying, OK, I have the same amount of time, but I can make a big credit with easier way, and I can earn my money, and I just don't want to spend time on SMEs. I believe the crucial problem is the way you set up the Basel. The Basel is wrongly set up. You need to understand it and change the proportion. You should focus on SMEs. This is the wealth creators. This is why Germany is so strong, because they have SME strong position. Forget about getting more and more regulation inside and understand when the value is coming is from the SMEs. Make them life easier. That will be my suggestion, if I can say, from my position. Yes. So and we are is, doing this as a shadow banking. We are yeah. doing that. We are giving money to SMEs because banks and yeah. Basel II doesn't care anymore. Okay. Thank you. So if you are a benevolent dictator, you will change Basel. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Well, I think that uh, increasing the capital ratio for the bank is a good thing and uh, will uh, not bring us to a great uh, development or overdevelopment of credit. I also think that deregulation will help as well. And uh, I think the two things maybe de go together. Deregulation. Deregulation of from, of the, from, the, from the, the, the financial system is getting too complicated and the only winners are the lawyers right now. Uh, the, all the ones only making money nowadays. All the banks are losing money, the companies are losing money, the lawyers are making money. <laughs> Some, some banks are making a lot of money, you know. Some. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure whether I am in favor of uh, further uh, money printing. It gives a lot of excuses to governments not to do their job, not to imp uh, implement the proper reforms. I've seen that in Europe, where Mario Draghi has waited for the, for the various countries to start reforms that are coming very slowly, not even finished yet, but then they push the central bank to print the money. So the politician absor may absorb their own duty of doing their proper work. Because then they say, oh, it's a central bank. Let's ask him to print money, and then we'll solve the problem. <coughs> but then the politician will have, have an even bigger role, and reforms take a long term to work out. While well, money, money printing can be done but pressing just one button. I think we need the politician to do their job first. Great. So you got three different perspectives. Okay. I think we'll stop here if you don't yep. mind. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, on on the first one. On the first one. It okay. Wait, let, let, me, let me make a short. Okay. Quick so we take one for before. Very short one. If because we have to finish. Sure. In five I minutes. understand that. So mine will be a question, not a statement. Uh, uh, if uh, if monetary finance was adopted by most of the advanced nations that are doing QE today, would it not be a currency war by stealth? And won't we have the law of unintended consequences at work? Thank no. you. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me begin. The the first and the, the fourth questions are somewhat related. I mean, on, on the very first question, I mean, you're quite right that printing money has often been used to support war efforts because people break taboos in conditions of war. Um, Milton Friedman, in his wonderful book, The Monetary History of the USA, uh, calculated with Anna Schwartz that if you wanted to understand how America paid for the Second World War, uh, you know, about 50% was with taxes, about 30% was with actual interest-bearing government bonds, but about 20% was essentially the printing of permanent uh, fiat money. Uh, others, like you know, the Germans in the First World War and the Japanese in the Second World War, relied more on it. But I don't think the fact that, sadly, that is what predominantly we have often used money printing to pay for, I don't think that knocks out the fact that it is technically possible to use it to pay for better things. And I certainly don't believe 
that the money printing option, which essentially, let's be clear that this is a fiscal deficit, this is fiscal expenditure, which happens to be lubricated by money finance. But essentially, it's fiscal expenditure. And as Milton Friedman put it, the great advantage of the fiscal expenditure is it gets directly into the income stream. It doesn't get there through these indirect mechanisms of interest rates and asset prices and portfolio rebalance effects. It's either a tax cut or it's a public expenditure increase. And because it's that, you can actually use it to stimulate the economy without the inequality effects which are bound to occur if instead you try and stimulate the economy with ultra-low interest rates. Because you can decide to whom you give the money, which categories of expenditure or tax cuts you afford. And it does not necessarily need to more credit because you can combine it with increasing the capital requirements and the reserve requirements against banks precisely to stop the fact that the initial money is multiplied by the banking multiplier. It, basically, the amount of money in the economy is the amount of fiat money which the government creates multiplied by the banking multiplier. You can have a policy which simultaneously uses a money finance fiscal deficit directly to stimulate the economy, and you prevent the subsequent creation of credit by your reserve asset requirements uh, and, and your capital. And I think that relates to the final question, uh, the, the fourth question, is this just another form of currency war. No, I don't think it is, because by because the transmission mechanism to the real economy is direct and understandable, right? This is somebody has a tax cut, they can go out and spend it, or this is infrastructure investment that you would not do. People are being employed to build bridges and roads. You have a stimulus to the economy which does not rely on the beggar by neighbor bit of currency devaluations. And that is why, and I repeat the point, you can't evaluate policies absolutely. You have to evaluate them relative to the other things uh, that you might be doing. On the question of uh, lending to SMEs, as it happens, I've just become, well, I have for the last year, between a, being a director, non-executive director, of a new startup bank solely focused on lending money to SMEs in the UK. There have been many startup banks in the UK uh, set up, three or four set up over the last few years. And what is intriguing is that most of them, once they get going, end up lending money against real estate uh, because that's the easy thing to do. Um, some of them, 80%, 70% of their portfolios are in what are called buy-to-let portfolios. They're investing to relatively rich individuals to buy residential properties so that they rent them out. Now, I think that that's a tendency which we can't entirely lean against, but I think we've encouraged it, and I think therefore I'm going to agree with you, by what we did in the Basel capital regimes. Because in the private models which we allow to set capital requirements, it always looks as if real estate is safer. The risk weights for a buy-to-let investment in the UK, a loan to a buy-to-let investor would typically be 35%, and the risk weights for an SME which isn't involved in buy-to-let, but it's trying to build a non-real estate business, are typically 100%. And I think we made a basic error in the Basel II, and then we carried it over to Basel III, by believing that the risk weights should be set entirely on private assessment of risks, because I think there is a difference between that which is a true risk to the individual bank versus that what is risk to society. And then the final point was about monetary printing. Ah, the argument of <coughs> does monetary printing or any form of stimulus prevent governments doing their job of structural reform? I entirely accept that before you start saying that we should consider the possibility of overt money finance of a fiscal deficit, you've got to answer the fundamental problem. Do we want an increase in nominal demand at all? I is part of our problem in the global economy at the moment an increase, a lack of nominal demand? If it is not a problem of nominal <coughs> demand, and all the problems are supply-side structural problems, well, fine. But if that is the case, 
We shouldn't have ultra-low interest rates, and we shouldn't have quantitative easing. Now, I think our problems are partly supply-side and structural, but I think there is an element of a deficiency of nominal demand as well. And if we agree that there's an element of nominal demand deficiency as well, and the best way to think about that is in Europe, the increase in nominal demand across the Eurozone over the last five years has only been about 0% you know, over that period, when you'd normally expect it to be 4 or 5%, if that is the case, if it's below the level that we want, then you have to debate the alternative ways to stimulate nominal demand. So your argument is essentially an argument against any form of stimulating nominal demand, and therefore it's an argument as much against ultra-low interest rates as against any form of monetary printing, or uh, indeed debt finance, fiscal deficits as well. But I think we face both supply structural effects and some elements of deficiency of nominal demand. You know, I began my introduction by saying that uh, clearly in the field of economics we need to do a lot of rethinking. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, very senior people in governments, in central banks, in private banks are uh, reading what a lot of debtors are saying, gosh, this is really new economic thinking. So in that sense, I must say it's very appropriate that you are the chairman of the Institute for New Economic Thinking and you've succeeded in delivering it to us here today uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School. So please join me in thanking Adair for this wonderful speech.